Hey everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com, and in this video, we'll be talking about negative externalities, positive externalities, and cap and trade policies. So, externalities. What does that word even mean? Well, it comes from the word external. So, that's when a third party, external, is affected by either the production or consumption of the good. So, let's take cigarettes, for example. Somebody other than just the cigarette vendor and the cigarette buyer is affected. You know, like the person who gets secondhand smoke blown in their face. They're negatively affected, even though they're, you know, not represented in the supplier demand curve. So, how do we represent that graphically? Well, long story short, with negative externalities, that's when they're affected, the external party is affected in a negative way, we're basically going to have two supply curves here. It's not really like one turns into the other or like shifts or anything. These are two supply curves that simultaneously exist. One is what the free market takes into account. That's the private cost curve. If you're buying cigarettes, you're not really taking into account secondhand smoke's cost because we're assuming that people aren't really that altruistic naturally. So... That's the private cost that people take into account. But simultaneously, the true cost for society, the social cost of cigarettes, includes a private. That's why it's always above it. So the, the true cost includes the private cost, but it also includes the external cost. So the gap between these two is the external cost, the marginal cost external. That's just the cost of the secondhand smoke. Once you add that cost in, the true cost is above here. So there's two simultaneous supply curves. Now, the one that people take into account, this red one, is what the free market equilibrium will be. So let's say in this free market, people choose to consume 10 million cigarettes. Well, what we're saying is that what should happen is that when they take into, if they were to take into account the true cost, as they should, then the equilibrium quantity, let's say, should have only been 7 million cigarettes instead of 10. So notice, economics is being very objective, right? It's not really saying, oh, let's ban cigarettes and force the quantity to be zero. And it's also not even saying, let's just do nothing and yeah, yay, freedom, let's let people smoke out as much as they want. It's saying, why are we even talking about cigarettes and not markers, for example? Well, it's because of that third party, because of that external cost, right? There's not really any third party involved in the sale of markers, but there are for cigarettes. And let's just objectively quantify how much worse off the secondhand smoke, you know, uh, is. Like, how much worse off we are because of that. That external cost, let's just factor that in and then smoke a little bit less. That's all economics is saying. So now, because of that, because of the fact that the free market's producing a different quantity, 10, instead of where we should be, 7, there's a deadweight loss. So this is like a case where, you know, the free market has a deadweight loss, kind of like with monopolies. So either way, the deadweight loss is always the area between these two, between the two quantities, between the social curves, right? So between, there's only one demand curve between that and the social demand curve. So a common misconception is to do it using the private curve, but keep in mind it's always between the social curves, between that and that. Now, if you wanted to fix this, if you were the government and you wanted to get rid of this deadweight loss, then what you can do is tax them. Because if you were to tax them, their quantity goes on in general, a tax always lowers the quantity. So to figure out the exact tax amount, all you have to do is look at the optimal quantity. You want the quantity of seven. So at that optimal quantity, whatever the external cost is, meaning the gap over there, just tax by that amount and then that'll cause the private curve to shift up and then the free market consumes now seven with, with the tax of course. And then you're at the optimal and you have no deadweight loss anymore. Now let's talk about positive externalities. That's when the third party, the external party, is actually affected in a positive way because of the production or consumption of some good. For example, education. Hmm, let's see. Statistically, if you go to college, you're less likely to stab your neighbor. So, your neighbor, even though they're not really paying for your schooling in any sort of way, they're getting some sort of a benefit from you going to school. They're, again, neither involved in the production nor consumption of you going to college, yet they get a benefit. So the problem with the free market is 
you're not going to take their benefit into account. You're only going to take your benefit into account. You know, like, oh yeah, I might make more money if I go to college. I'll learn stuff and, you know, feel good about myself and the world. And so either way, you're only taking your benefit into account, not theirs. And so really, if you were to take that external benefit into account, that then the society's benefit is going to be this black curve. So this is the external benefit. If you were to add that in, this red curve really should be this black curve over here. Notice again here, there's two simultaneous demand curves that exist. One is the one that privately you take into account, and this is the one you should take into account. So really what we're saying is, if you were to take all the benefits into account, the true quantity that you should uh, do is four years of schooling. But if you're only gonna take your private benefit into account, you're only gonna get two years of schooling. So now the dead weight, so again here, because you're not at the optimal quantity of four, there's a dead weight loss. Again, the dead weight loss is always between the two quantities, between where you should be and where you are, and it's just the area between the supply and demand curve. But again, the true, the social curves is where dead weight loss is measured from. So it's really just between the two black curves here. So that is the dead weight loss if there is no government. So now, if you're the government of this uh, town and you're wondering, hey, you know, how do I get rid of the dead weight loss? Really, all you have to do is somehow make the people consume a quantity of four instead of two, and then you're not going to have any dead weight loss anymore. And the only government action really that can increase the quantity consumed in a market is subsidy. So subsidy, again, it's just a polar opposite of a tax. That's where you're giving people money for doing something, and that's actually going to increase the quantity. So really what you have to do is you, uh, to find the exact subsidy amount at the optimal quantity, look at what the benefit is there. So at, or at the gap over there, the marginal external benefit at that quantity, the optimal quantity, if you subsidize it by that much, the supply shifts done by that much, and then now the private market, even the red curve now intersects at the quantity of four, and there won't be any dead weight loss anymore. And finally, let's talk about cap and trade. Let's say, you know, there's a negative externality for pollution in some market, and let's say, you know, you did the math and you figured out that 40 is the optimal quantity, the socially optimal quantity is 40. Now, if there's only one business doing that pollution, you could even just, you know, tell them, hey, only pollute 40 units, and they're like, okay, fine. So that's one way to do it. But what if there's actually two companies? What if there's two different companies, and you just want that they add up to polluting exactly 40 units? Well, do you just, you know, split them equally? Do you just say, hey, uh, you both have to pollute 20 units each, or do you uh, give, let the bigger company maybe pollute more? Well, how much more, you know? So... The best thing to actually do is to let them figure it out on their own. So rather than assigning quantities, like fixed quantities, what you should do is give them what's called permits. So one permit lets you pollute one ton or something like that. And if you only make 40 permits, period, and assuming that they follow the law, well then you're kind of guaranteeing that only 40 tons of pollution will happen. So that's what cap and trade is. Cap, the cap part of it is you saying, hey, only 40 units of pollution need to happen to have no dead weight loss. So how do I do that? Make 40 permits. That's You're capping it at 40 permits. But then you could split them however you want. Let's say you just gave them both 20 permits each. And, you know, but then rather, rather than just forcing them to do that, you could say, hey, you know what? You guys can trade permits with each other if you want at whatever price you want. So that's where the trade part comes in. So that's what cap and trade is. It's when the government, when there's more than one entity that's doing the pollution, and you want the total to add up to a certain number, you cap it at that, give them tradable permits, and let them figure it out. So let's say you have these graphs where these are the abatement costs. Abatement just means reduction, so it's their cost of reducing pollution. Let's say there's these two companies that are polluting, Apple and Toshiba, and you want, let's say, the quantity, the total quantity to be 40, and let's say you decided to give 20 permits to each, 20 permits, to each firm. The question might be, what's the equilibrium price of a permit and how, who will buy how many permits from whom? Well, the way to solve a problem like that is this. You really just have to guess and check for the price. Usually there won't be a lot of options, so it's actually not that bad to do. So let's say we're wondering, what if the price of a permit was four? What if, you know, they both got 20 permits each, Toshiba and Apple and now they're saying, hey, okay, you know what? What if uh, I could buy or sell permits for $4 each? Well, let's just look at Toshiba. Toshiba at $4, they'll want to pollute five units. 
So if they're given 20 permits, they're willing to sell 15 of them because they only really need to pollute five. And at that price of four, Apple wants to pollute 20 units. So they're actually, they're, they don't want to trade with anyone because they're like, we want to pollute 20 and we'll, we'll, we were given 20 permits, so we'll just pollute 20. So that's not really an equilibrium because then 25 units will uh, be polluted. But really, we have, there's 40 permits in circulation. So that would, that's almost like too high a, of a price for polluting. So let's just guess and check another value. So let's try $3. At $3, Apple wants to pollute 10 units. So out of the 20 permits that they're given, they're willing to sell 10. And at $3, again, so really, you're seeing Apple will want to pollute 30 units. So they're only given 20 permits, though, so they're going to want to buy 10. Ah, so really, all you're doing is you're checking for this. At what price do the two quantities add up to 40, the total number of permits in circulation? And so at 3, for example, we saw that 10 and 30 added up to 40 which means no matter what the initial split was, if it was 20 and 20 for each, whoever wants to buy will, uh, will be able to buy exactly the number from the guy who wants to sell because they're going to add up to 40 anyways. So that's why here for this problem, we could say that, all right, in this graph, the equilibrium price of a permit will be $3 and Toshiba will sell 10 of their permits to Apple. Now let's look at a couple questions from students. If taxes lower both CS and PS, how can it get rid of a deadweight loss? Hmm, let's see. So it's absolutely, you're absolutely right that you know anytime there's a tax, it will lower both CS and PS. But in this case, the issue was that there was a lot of external costs too that wasn't counted in either CS or PS. The external cost meaning the cost of secondhand smoke. So what the tax actually did was it lowered, didn't get rid of it because there's still some smoking, but it lowered the external costs. It lowered secondhand smoking costs by more than uh, how much CS and PS went down by. And so that's why... Uh, at the end of the day, the deadweight loss goes away because now the total surplus, including, you know, that low external cost, is higher. And our final question. If subsidies always increase the quantity and get rid of deadweight loss, why don't we subsidize every good? It's a great question. It seems like, you know, if we were to subsidize every good, you know, people are having more stuff and that's good, right? Well, here's the thing. That only works if there's a positive externality. Otherwise, what happens is if there's no externality, the free market will already be consuming the correct amount. And in that case, if you were to further subsidize that, then it's almost like you're having too much of that good. So that actually would create a deadweight loss. Like if the government just said, hey, you know, let's subsidize pizza, which really doesn't have a positive externality. Well, then what's going to happen is people are just going to have two more pizza than they really should. It's going to cost more for society to make those pizzas than the benefit really is. And so, you know, that's actually less... Uh, less total surplus in that case. So there's actually more deadweight loss there. So positive externalities, the subsidy really only worked because with education or vaccines or something where a third party is also benefiting, that's when the free market's producing too low a quantity. So in that case, the subsidy gets rid of the deadweight loss. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at besteconcutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.